Thanks, Eugenia. In this lesson, we will focus on query strings in ASP.NET Core 7. We will explore what query strings are compound of, the symbols used, and practical coding tasks related to working with query strings. If you have any questions or need clarification along the way, feel free to comment below. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel for more exciting lessons like this. Let's jump right in and start learning. The query string is often referred to as a scary string due to presence of numerous characters and symbols. Let's explore the meaning of these symbols. The main symbols you will encounter in query strings are the question mark, equal sign, ampersand, and percentage sign. The rest of the characters in the query string are also important to understand. However, for now, we will focus on discussing these four main symbols. I will write here a piece of code which represents a query string. This query string consists of key value pairs. To separate the URL from the query string, a question mark is placed at the beginning. Each key value pair is separated by an equal sign, and if multiple pairs are present, they are separated by an ampersand. This type of string is commonly used to trigger specific endpoints in the backend server program. It allows us to pass parameters or data to the server to perform various operations. For example, we can use the query string to retrieve specific values from a database or send sorted data back to the client. I'll create additional if-else statements to verify specific query strings in the request URL. First, we will check if the method get and the URL contains the path user. Then we will verify the root URL doesn't have any query string. Next, we will check if the query string contains only the name parameter with the value of John. The last if statement will verify if the query string includes an address parameter. I will enter these query strings in the browser to test if all endpoints are functioning correctly. Let's see the first query string, which is for the user endpoint. The response is successful. Next, we will test the root endpoint, and it also returns a successful response. Now we will test a query string containing the parameter name, with the value of John, and it passes successfully. Lastly, we will add an address parameter to the query string and it also returns an expected result. To maintain consistency, let's include a number to test if spaces work properly. As you can see, the query strings are functioning as intended. We talked a lot about response. Now let's discuss the request. The request headers are similar to the response headers. They consist of key value pairs that contain relevant information for data transfer. But in this case, it is data transfer from the client to the server, or simply the request. Among the list of headers you see on your screen, the content type is commonly used in application programming. The data is typically transferred using formats such as JSON, URL encoded data, or binary, using multipart form data. The authorization header may contain tokens attached to the request, while the cookies header provides available cookies. The remaining headers are not as commonly used, but they serve specific purposes. The user agent header reflects information about your browser, and the referrer header contains the URL that referred you to the current URL. The referrer headers is also relevant to the cross-region resource sharing, or CORS. The cache control header provides information about cache handling, among the other headers. Now let's return to the DevTools. All these headers are available there, and this data will be sent to the server. In our case, Kestrel will receive this information, so become familiar with these headers as we will be using them throughout this course. In the browser, we can see all the headers. Now let's examine how these headers will appear on the server side. We need a variable to access them, and we can iterate over the output using the for each method. Alright, now we have all the headers displayed in the browser. Let's understand what we have accomplished here. 
we send these headers from the browser along with the GET request to the server. The server then forwarded these headers back to the browser in the form of HTML document. The diagram we recently discussed with the header names corresponds to the information you currently see on your screen. By utilizing various conditions, we can perform checks on the request headers. For instance, we can determine if the request contains the Keep Alive header, indicating that the client wishes to keep the connection open for subsequent requests. We can also examine the user agent header to identify the browser type or verify if the cache control is set to public or private. These checks allow us to gather in specific information from the headers and tailor our service behavior accordingly. For example, we can authenticate the request based on the presence of the auth header. Then we can proceed with authorization, otherwise we will receive an error message. The code has been updated with a few additional lines, including a verification step to check if there is an auth header present. In our case, we receive a not authorized error because, upon inspecting the request headers in the browser's DevTools, we can see that there is no auth header attached to the request we send to the server. This is essentially how it works. We send a request, attach headers to it, and the server processes the request and sends back a response based on its own logic and headers. This exchange of requests and responses continues in a continuous cycle. Now you may be wondering how to attach a header to a request. For that we have a specific tool called Postman, which we will discuss in the next lesson. Before we begin the next lesson, please download and install the Postman application. It is a standard installation that will allow us to explore and interact with the requests, including attaching custom headers. And as always, lesson assignments. At the conclusion of each lesson, I highly encourage you to complete the assignments, as they will greatly contribute to your progress in ASP.NET Core 7. By consistently practicing, you will see faster results in your learning journey. And the assignments answer you can download from the GitHub. The link is below. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or need further assistance, feel free to comment below. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more great coding content. Stay updated with the latest videos by ringing the notification bell. Happy coding!